You're listening to the No Schedule Man podcast with Kevin Bulmer, exploring real stories and lessons learned with a variety of special guests. To learn more about Kevin and to access other episodes of the podcast, please visit NoScheduleman.com and connect and contribute at No Schedule Man on Twitter or Instagram and on Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud, all backslash No Schedule Man. Thanks for listening and enjoy the No Schedule Man podcast. Hi, I'm Kevin Vollmer. This is the No Schedule Man podcast, and thanks so much for taking the time to listen. I've been meaning to start doing something like this for, for quite a little while now. It feels good to finally get started. In all my imaginings of this, there was really only one person that I thought could be the first guest, and that's my great good pal, a guy named Derek Rock Botton. Rock is the nickname. That's not his actual middle name. <laughs> At least I don't think so. Part of my career involved working as an announcer and later some other things uh, at a stock car racing track in this area called Delaware Speedway. And that's where I first met Derek Botton. And he and I are going to talk about that. You'll hear that conversation in just a couple of moments. You might know Derek as a really well-established, much-loved and very respected media personality in this city, which is London, Ontario, Canada. And for many years, Derek created and operated an event called the World of Motorcycles Expo here in the southwestern Ontario area as well. Derek is also a terrific writer, and more than that, he's just a really wonderful human being and a good friend of mine. Plus, he never lets me operate a chainsaw without my help. I could talk with Derek for hours on many different subjects, but for this conversation, we stuck to recalling our time that we first got introduced to each other uh, and experienced some interesting things as announcers at that stock car track called Delaware Speedway. This is my conversation with Derek Rock Botton on the No Schedule Man podcast. I think it was, if memory serves, 1999 that you and I first announced the Delaware together. What are your recollections of that time? I know it was late 90s. I know I was working at the, uh, at the radio station in the Free Press building on York Street at the time. And I think it was one of our sales reps had heard from Tony Novotny saying, who owned the track, was a promoter at the track, and said, well, you know, you might, uh, might need an announcer out there. Yeah, all right, whatever. I like racetracks. I'm sure I'll give it a try. <laughs> I like racetracks. Well, I, I, growing up in Byron, I can remember as a kid, but way before I'd ever went there, that I can remember hearing Friday nights, you know, in the distance, so what are they doing? Oh, that's racing out there in Delaware. And one day I convinced my dad to take us out there. And we went out and saw what it was like in it. So I, I have fond memories of it from way back. And then when I uh, uh, heard that there was an opening, I thought, perfect. Now, at this point, I had done announcing at Sparta, the racetrack, the, half of the uh, drag strip just outside of St. Thomas for a couple of seasons. And, uh, and I don't think it was any of those connections. But I think somebody knew that I was there and thought, well, maybe you want to work closer to home and go work for Tony. So I went out and talked to Tony, and it just it seemed automatic. I don't recall having to do much <laughs> except show up. And then he said, yeah, I'm looking at getting another, another fella in. He's another radio guy. Maybe you've heard of Kevin Bulmer. It's like, yeah, no, but whatever. If he's a radio guy, he can't be all bad, can he? <laughs> and, and I don't know if Tony had it in his mind or if you'd already been hired for the booth position, and somehow it was, well, here's what we've got. It's wearing a, wearing a racing suit, running shoes and a cap and walking around with a wireless microphone. That's what it is. Are you, are you interested? And I went, <laughs> you mean I just got to talk and I get to watch the races for free? Okay. And that's my recollection of it. I met you early on, I think, when after we'd both been hired. Oh, here, Kevin, Derek, Derek, Kevin. Okay, yeah, nice to meet you. Let's have at her. See, my recollection is that it was Brad McGonigal that reached out. I'd forgotten that Tony was running the track at that time, and he still was. Uh, I may be misremembering <laughs> a word that I think Roger Clemens invented. <laughs> uh, because I know I was involved at a race at the end of the 1998 season. There was a sportsman invitational. And I remember that because 98 is cemented in my brain. That's the year that Mike Kilbreth and I started the pit crew show in Sarnia, which is, I think, what led to being asked to be a part of, of Delaware. But in 99, that was the start of the first full season because if I remember correctly, it was you and me and Ron St. Clair, right? Yes, and Ron, yes. Ron was the anchor. Yep. And so I was really just kind of the tower sidekick and you were the pit reporter right from, from the word go. But I think he used to come in on the train from, was it Kingston maybe? Yeah, from quite a ways away. And we couldn't believe it when we, he used to tell us the distance he'd travel to be a part of this. 
But good, good thing, because you and I didn't have a clue what we were doing. <laughs> good thing we had some brains what, around us. What do you mean, didn't have? <laughs> okay, maybe you still don't, but... Well, but... And we, we got on, it seemed like, right away. Yeah. Wouldn't you say? Yep, I would. Why do you think that was? One thing, and I'm, I don't want to be blowing smoke up your kilt, if you were wearing a kilt, uh, you always came off as being really organized. Like, you weren't one of those, <laughs> kind of guys. You, you just, I don't know, you, you seemed fairly level-headed. You had a broadcast background. You could speak fluently and, and uh, uh, on your toes. And you were, and I remember, I mean, as the years went on, you had binders this big with all the information and you could more than better than anybody I'd ever seen go back and go, you know, two years ago at this particular race, he did this and uh, that many pit stops and uh, took a time out for a baby Ruth and, uh, you know, uh, you kept really good records as we went on. And I thought right from the get go, you just came off as really well organized. I'm the unscripted doofus with a live wireless microphone down trackside. You're the one carrying all the weight. I'm just out there goofing with people and having fun. So you made my world a whole lot easier. That's probably why I liked you. <laughs> Sorry, I'm putting unscripted doofus onto my band names list. Sure. Mr. your brother Colin and I have one working. <laughs> we may not see each other in the halls every day anymore, but we still every now and then a text will go back. Anyway, I have slight diversion there. And I, as I understand the rules of that particular thing, it has to come up in the course of a normal conversation and somebody has to pluck it out of the ether like you just didn't go, there's a band name. Uh, I didn't know that there were actual rules. If there are any rules. You can't just sit there and brainstorm and uh, you have a couple of loggers and think, well, it'd be a good name for a... I'll have to follow that up with Colin, but uh, you know, the pirate code is more like guidelines than actual rules. Right. Right. Anyway, getting back uh, on track, as it were, no pun intended, you were the... <laughs> unscripted doofus. The, we'll call it the pit reporter right away. Yes. Right? Uh, so you were immediately charged with having the wireless microphones, which most of the time worked. Most of the time. Some of the time didn't. Yes. And when you're talking about having records kept, my mind is being taken back to, this was before digital age and oh, iPods yes. and oh, yeah. all of this kind of stuff. So even the music that we would play on the PA, I'd burn different discs and yep. um, have to cue those up for the introduction music and, and things like that. But even in terms of knowing when you were going to talk so that I would take enough of a breath so that we could actually hear you for a moment, we even kind of worked that out over time. It seems to time. me, now correct me if I'm wrong, because again, fading memories with age, but it seems to me if I just clicked my on-off button on the side of the microphone, it made like a little dog whistle sound to your ear, a little audible that well, immediately told you I was ready with something and, and it seemed fairly... Yeah, it was more than that. It was, um, you were right in the middle of all the action. So I could hear the rumble of the cars and, and the atmosphere. So you would have on a, a, a pair of fairly heavy headphones, right? Yep, full, full ear cup things. I think some noise cancelers would have done you well. Probably right. <laughs> <laughs> if only we'd known. So when you would flick the mic switch on, I was wearing headphones up in the tower because that was a buzz with activity. The scorers yakking at each other and the scoreboard operators. And for the big events, we'd have media up there in the, the treehouse. What a lovely, <laughs> <laughs> lovely little spot. Uh, so in order to be able to hear myself think, I would have headphones on. When you would click that on, I'd hear kind of a low rumble Yeah. Uh, most of the time. It wasn't foolproof. But it got so that we were pretty slick with that. And I think that after a while, we kind of had a sense of when we were going to try to reach out for, for one or the other anyway, wouldn't you say? You mean like after sparks and a loud, sickening thunk against? <laughs> yes, of course. And that was the, that was the I'm, again, most of the races we did, most of them were at nighttime. Yep. And I know I had a white hat on and I had a red, white, and blue Delaware fire suit on. Yep. And I would be, and I think you could see ultimately from the tower that I, oh, I'm winging my way over there. And you could tell if I was there most of the time or I, not. You know what? I rarely saw you. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. There's me down there waving, thinking, Kev, I'm right here. I would often say something very insightful, like, um, oh, for instance, well, I wonder where Derek is now. <laughs> Let's go down to the pits and find out. <laughs> well, luckily, I had that in my ear, and I could pick up on it pretty quick. Again, <laughs> most of the time, I was near somebody or something that I could talk to or about. Um, I can remember a couple of times being uh, at an accident site on the racetrack. Somebody had wadded up into a corner. And I remember a couple of times getting there before the safety crew did. 
And it was kind of neat being right in the middle of it. But I realized in retrospect, that probably wasn't the best place for me to be before the safety crew had got there. But I think we got some interesting um, comments from racers. Let me back this up for a bit and talk about it from the perspective of someone who's listening that has no concept of what Delaware Speedway is. So that they can understand that here's a half mile racetrack, half mile around oval. So I'm not quick enough with math to be able to figure out the amount of territory that you're trying to cover. But it's, as you said, probably dark yep. because it's at night. There are yep. lights shining down on the racetrack. Yep. But a lot of the time you're running around on pit road where there are race cars and trucks moving in and out. Or through the infield of the racetrack where there are cars and trucks moving out. A lot of parts, pieces, people working on vehicles. A um, lot of stress. <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of tension, uh, high activity, dangerous area. And as the events are going on, you are trying to discern what part of the facility to be in geographically. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to draw that to a question after that, but it, 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 was, it was a big ground to cover, a dangerous area. Where you can't hear particularly well, and you're kind of guessing in terms of where to be? How did yeah. you manage that? Well, I, I won't claim to have managed it all that well necessarily because there's no way to predict. Uh, you can't go from one corner, kitty corner, to the other side of the racetrack in a, in a minute. It, it's two or three minutes at a full trot down there, especially being mindful of cars and crossing the infield and what have you. Um, so sometimes I would be in the right place at the right time, and sometimes I wouldn't. And sometimes I'd be huffing going, I'm almost there, Kev. Okay, I can't see from now, but okay, I'll tell you when I get there. Uh, it was a lot of a lot of footwork doing that. I enjoyed it. I tended to stay more on the on the pit road side of the racetrack, facing the grandstands, as much for you to know where I was. If you could see, clearly you you can't see, but if you could have seen where I was, you could direct me uh, either by way of direction or by saying, "I'm sure Derek's on his way over to the middle of turn three, where there is an altercation." <laughs> But I, sometimes I didn't know. And, of course, when you're down there at track level, you can't see the whole track. I didn't have the benefit of the full track view like you did. Well, you can't from the tower either. Well, you, you can, but you can't. I mean, you yeah. can. I, I guess you could see the entire racing surface, but you can only focus on so much of an area at, at once. True enough. And which when, is, I think, why sometimes I would see you and, and most times I wouldn't. Because for the most part, I was either watching what was going on on the track or taking the breaks that you would give me when you were interviewing a driver either in the pits or after a race or a heat race was complete to make those notes that you alluded to earlier uh, or cue up a, a sound or something like that or get a cue from the score to try to find out what was going on. Um, the more I think of it, there were a lot of, there were a lot of moving parts and pieces to trying to, to do that job. And I think once we worked out a sort of a, a system you knew that i wasn't going to necessarily be there right away but we carry on and sometimes you would you would say well and maybe derek can check out what's happening with that flaming pile of race car in the pits and i would um, be on my way over there and tell you later sometimes i would interview a driver to find okay what was the problem why did you hit the wall well my brakes went down or my tire went off or my tie rod broke or something um and then report back to you later because by that time i'd be back out front on pit road and you'd and then the time would come a break in the action and you'd send it down to me. Yep. And I was over there and I talked to Buddy and this is what he told me and he's okay and everything's. So it was a you're right a lot of a lot of bits and pieces and in no specific format you just kind of had to wing it every minute of every every night we had to wing it out there because you never knew what was going to happen. Well, and sometimes you had to go up to people that didn't necessarily want to talk to you. Oh, absolutely. And that you have to do with a little bit of finesse. And and again, I think credit to the drivers. Because for the most part, they understood. Even when they were seeing red and they were peaking, there's an awful lot of adrenaline that flows in the seat of those race cars when they're out there just before they get going, just after they've stopped. There's all kinds of adrenaline going on. And especially when somebody's doing right and doesn't think he was in, at fault in an altercation, yet he's been taken out or wrecked. Um, there's a lot of anger that goes on that translates from the adrenaline. And, and very, very rarely, but there were a couple of times I asked a question of, and stuck a microphone in somebody's face and it came out wrong. Um, <laughs> that wasn't, and because you're live and the whole grandstand of people yeah. is listening to this race car driver 
explaining in no uncertain terms what he just thought happened. Um, but for the most part, the drivers, to their credit, were good. Even and, and this is something you when you, for instance, whack your thumb with a hammer sometime, and then try and say something nice. That's a real tough thing to do. These guys were real good at that. The the real pros. So again, made my life easier. I just hey, you're okay. What happened? Well, this is what happened. You know, biting through their tongue and saying, I'm not sure what that guy thought he was doing, even though they wanted to come up with some. Nicer adjectives than that. You talked about uh, some of the times when there were, we would call them incidents. <laughs> <laughs> Discouraged from using the word crash. Yes. Um, for me, those were the toughest. Yep. I'm wondering if there are some that immediately uh, pop into your recollection, a time that something happened on the track that was memorable to you. What comes to mind? Um you know, we, we see a lot of, and I'll, I'll just back, I'll answer that by backing up a little bit. We see sure. a lot of incidents on a racetrack, a lot of cars getting wrecked, a lot of metal getting bent. Um, and surprisingly and thankfully, not a ton of personal injury. Sometimes drivers get rattled, but, not, but surprisingly, the safety features built into the race cards, even at the level of Delaware Speedway on a regular local Friday night track, they're made to be safe. One time, there was a fella driving a truck in the truck series going down the back stretch and his truck went out of control and crashed onto the inside wall right at turn three and came to rest all by himself he didn't hit anything else is my recollection and yet he wasn't moving so i'm running over there to see what's going on the safety crews all over it then they red flagged the racetrack they they um couldn't get they were having a tough time, it would appear to me, to get him out of the, out of the truck. And I didn't understand, and I'm the worst place for me would be to right, be right on top of it. I understand you've got you to gotta let the safety crew do their thing. A couple of times you threw it down to me. What's going on? Well, from 20 feet away, Kev, I can't see. But they, and they had backed up the safety truck on one side so you couldn't see this, as they will do in the cases where they suspect injury. Uh, and it turned out a fella had had a heart attack in his truck. And according to the, the later reports... He was dead before his truck had hit the had hit the wall. It wasn't the injury that killed him. It was a heart attack. And your heart's in your throat for the entire time that it's going on. You just you're pulling for the guy. You want him to be okay and you think, well, it didn't look that serious, but you you can't surmise that something well, in my vast medical knowledge, I would say that this is going you couldn't. Let the safety guys do what they can. When I can get a word in edgewise with one of them, I will talk to them. And and I know that you did a, a real stout job up there on the trying to talk and trying not to a, a alarm everybody in the stands. And I'm right down there, and I can't say anything either. I'm like, man, he's not moving. It doesn't look good. What's going on? And, and anyway, that uh, still brings chills to my mind, um, and it is probably one of the more memorable times I had out there. Not one of the happier memories, for sure. But uh, That was a rare, very rare occasion. That was Stan Harborn. Yes. And that involves uh, many of us from the track attending his funeral a few days later. As and you said, and grief was, counseling at the track yeah, afterwards did. for yeah, us. Yeah, we did. And um, as you alluded to a few minutes ago, that, that was a very rare thing. And that was not the result of an incident on no. the racetrack. No. Um, but at a time like that, for me, and I'm going to lead into something which is a little bit more lighthearted that applies to you, <laughs> you on, the, on the track at a time maybe similar to that, but I'm in the tower, and my job at that point is to continue to talk to the crowd without saying anything, yep. because I don't know either. Yep. And you've got kids, and you've got family and friends and sponsors, and you don't know, so what do you say? You can only go, hey, well, we'll uh, report back to you as soon as we have more information. Meantime, do you have your 50-50 tickets? <laughs> Don't forget to buy a snow cone, kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Truly, though, there were all sorts of things, beats that we would want to make sure that we covered through the course of the night. What's coming up in the next few weeks? What had happened earlier in the night? What's available at the concession stands, the souvenirs, 50-50 programs, sponsor recognition, on and on and on and on and on. The hardest and least enjoyable parts of that job for me was when something was happening on the track and especially when it was serious enough for the emergency vehicles to be out there with with their lights flashing 
and because you just have to talk through it. There were only two or three times, I think, where I finally just said, you can see what I can see. Take a break, go to the washroom, get something to eat, and then just actually put some music on. Uh, but that only happened a couple of times, I think. Maybe your recollections no, will I, back that absolutely. up or not. But for I, the most part, I would just try to talk through it just so the people could have a bit of a voice. Yep. Everything's going to... And 9.975 times out of 10, it, it was okay, Yep. right? Um, but there were a couple of times getting to that where <laughs> it turned out okay, but there was still a long delay. Here's one that I remember well because it was an important lesson that was taught to me. Kenny Fourth on yep. the front straightaway. Yep. Do you remember that one? Uh, I don't remember what happened to get him there. He was driving the blue 86 Ford, yep. late model car. Well, sportsman car as we called it at the time. And it was serious enough that they cut the, the, there was a fiberglass body of these race cars at the time. Maybe they still are. I don't follow it as much anymore. But they actually cut the uh, a square out of the roof of the car to be able to extract him that way. Do you remember this? Yeah, hey, I, I don't. I'm thinking of another Kenny Ford thing on the back straightaway where his car went, climbed right up on the side wall. So this is a different incident, obviously. All, well, we had a few cars. I remember sending a modified car over the wall and threw a billboard in turn three. But <laughs> here's why I bring up the Kenny Ford one is that okay. this, was one, this was a teaching moment for me. It was one of only um, a few times that I can remember Brad McGonigal pulling me aside. Uh, Brad was the manager... I can't remember what year it was that it switched over from when Tony owned it to when Brad and his partners owned it. But anyway, I, I'll say that... It, 2000, 2001. Something. Anyway, I was answering to Brad, yep. uh, who is always really, really good to me, and would just leave us to it, and yep. would very, very rarely pull me aside and say, hey, <laughs> you know, like a program director on the radio, hey, unscripted doofus, we need to, uh, <laughs> we need to show a little bit better judgment here. Yeah. Uh, and one of them was Kev don't send it down to Derek when he's standing beside, I'm paraphrasing, this wasn't exactly what he said, but but the scenario was basically, Derek doesn't know any more than you do. You can see from where you are, he's in the car and the safety crew's there and they're going to cut him out. Don't put him on the spot like that so that he all he can say is, I don't know, I'll get back to you. Yeah. Uh, it was good and valid feedback. And that had, it, it was fairly early on in us doing that. Um, but for whatever reason, that Kenny Forth, and he was okay, by the way. That's why that incident sticks in my mind was because I was just tired of talking. <laughs> <laughs> I was tired of trying to sell souvenirs and hot dogs. And they were still in the business of cutting poor Kenny out of the car. So, well, let's see if anything's new. I hadn't heard the click to know that you were getting ready to talk. I just hoped that maybe you'd had something else. And, of course, all you could say was, Well, let Button stumble for 10 or 15 seconds, and I'll be able to get a drink of water. <laughs> well, but that was a case where it was right in the front straightaway, yeah. right in front of the, the people that were sitting on the hill. Yeah. For those that have never been to the track before, you want to understand that it, it's a, we would call a it bowl. a bowl. Yeah, like a natural amphitheater where part of it's grandstands, but part of it is just grass hill that you can sit fairly close to the yeah. fence. In fact, Ken Allward... <laughs> up in the, the announcer's tower had this sign that said uh, fence call or back from the fence or keep and he would just hold it up to this plexiglass so that I would look and ask kids to go back from the safety fence. Yep. Um, the incident I've just described was one where, you know, th th this is very real. It's all happening right in front of you. And if it had been a, uh, a more negative situation, it would have been right in front front of people and you were always there with the you know first responders and yeah and, and sometimes manage. i had something to say and so or something i could offer and sometimes i didn't it was again we winged it right that's what it was i remember you're talking about brad about brad being really good and not coming down on us for much but i remember one time do you remember the time you and i you're gonna talk about the enduro, the now, enduro. aren't you <laughs> Now, we, now, for what it's worth, Enduro is a different type and class of racing. It took place at Delaware, typically on the Sunday afternoons or Saturday <laughs> afternoons. Um, it wasn't a night race, generally. And Kevin and I didn't normally do the Enduros. And I can't really remember why we both got conscripted to do it. Well, I, I would be there, but yeah. It, well, me, I wasn't. <laughs> you and I got going, and I think because 
I think, quite frankly, in retrospect, we were a little bit bored. <laughs> it wasn't the same as the, the action and the, the quick, you know. Enduro racing, you start all the cars at once, and they don't shut that race. They don't red flag it unless somebody's in danger. And if a car wrecks, you stay in the car, and the cars keep going around. And, and at that time, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 120 cars or something, yeah. which would actually start of it kind of dwindling. Yeah. Um, it used to be far more than that. But So if you can imagine a half-mile stock car track, think of, um, if you're a NASCAR fan or if you've even seen highlights, Martinsville or, or Bristol. Bristol. Yeah. Um, Delaware is the same size as that. Different sort of an oval shape, but the same size. Think about how full it looks with 43 cars on it. Well, now, I'm <laughs> now imagine it with... Three times up. Exactly. And they would all just get going, and within two or three laps, you'd really have very little idea who was where. You'd have to look at this. Even we would be looking at the scoring tower because the transponders are scores that they would have to tell you who was in the lead. And you'd be able to follow the top three or four cars, even as announcers. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> after the, that, we had no idea. They, they were a nightmare to, to try to announce. And that one time you and I ended up in the tower together, standing beside each other. And we turned into Mutt and Jeff, Laurel yeah. and Hardy, yeah. Boondoggle and Mudflap. It was a train wreck. <laughs> we had fun for two hours, but I got called into the office that Monday morning. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think even during the race, we were told to... Well, tell, explain why. I, I don't really remember what we were saying, but we were, I think there were voice characterizations going on, and we assessed names to a couple of the cars or drivers um, that weren't maybe most, the most flattering. And maybe you can fill in the blanks more than I can, but I know we went off the rails. We were just beside ourselves, amusing ourselves. And, and the thing is... The audience that's the, at an enduro race is the friends and family and sponsors of all those hundred and something cars yep. made up the bulk of the audience. So no matter what, if you're insulting them, <laughs> you're not just insulting a car and thinking that he can't hear you. You're insulting a whole cluster of fans and family and sponsors. And we weren't trying to insult we anybody. We weren't trying to. No, but it's that's... But, as, but we were just being... As it was we pointed be, out to us. <laughs> we were being <laughs> silly because... We were entertained, yeah. And uh, the peanut gallery and the the scoring group, Troy and Ken and Angie and the rest, they were laughing at us. So I think we thought we were uh, we were doing well. And it's like when you get the giggles at a family dinner table. Yeah, <laughs> and it just continued to feed. You're right. We were doing uh, different silly voices, and, and I can't remember what. Frankly, I've tried to block that <laughs> from, from my memory. Sorry but to I, pick no, the I had open. <laughs> I had prepared myself emotionally that that might come up here today. <laughs> And that Monday morning, so that race was on a Saturday. The Monday morning, uh, Brad <laughs> Brad called me into his office. And like, Kev, I need to talk to you for a minute. Sure, what's up? And, and he he had a, a pile of three or four papers that were emails that he had been sent that he uh -oh. printed, and he says, "I'm just going to I'm just going to read this first one." And it, it went something like, uh, uh, "Dear sir, you know we were we took our annual trip to the racetrack this past Saturday. The announcers uh, ruined our day. Oh dear, <laughs> <laughs> we were <laughs> we were fortunate." Uh, that we didn't see a lot of that. Generally, the feedback that we got, I think, was was pretty positive. And you know what, Derek? I, I still get, and this will sound probably narcissistic and self-serving. I know where you're going, and so do I. I yep. still get people that say, you know, we miss hearing, well, what they would say. <laughs> what, now it's you and Derek, if they say it to me. Through that whole uh, course of time, it was always Derek and the other guy. We like Derek and the other guy. Well, I wasn't on, on the radio in London at that time. Right. I was just an announcer at the racetrack. But for the most part, at that time, I was working in Sarnia and then transitioned to actually working at the track as the sales and marketing manager. And then I just also happened to be the announcer as well. Being on the air on BX93 and some other stuff here in London, that all came af well after that fact, yeah, after right. I was done that. So you were the established media personality. So it was Derek and the other guy. But to, to go back to the point... Um, every now and then, yeah, I still get people that, that say, gosh, you know, we miss, we miss hearing you guys. And do you hear I, that I, same I thing? Get, I get that too. And it's, it's kind of nice and you kind of tugs at something inside and you think, well, thanks for remembering is all you can do. Yeah, we had fun. It was a good run. I'm wondering if there are other couple of memories before we round third here that stick out in that time. Uh, because, you know, we did everything from the large national events which were a whole different kettle of fish. Yep. Uh, rarely Enduros, but we did do some of those. Um, the Friday nights, we've talked about a couple of incidents, but what about, you know, maybe exciting moments or um, 
what maybe comes to mind and feel free to think about it if you want. Well, one, one that comes to mind and it's just, it's another one of those racing incidents, but it was one of the more uh, spectacular ones that I witnessed, especially right down at the front of the front of all the goings on. I was on pit road and for folks that are picturing seeing up in the stands and you're looking down, the cars are coming around counterclockwise. So they're going left to right and into turn one. Oftentimes when you've come around and you're doing a full bore punch down the front line and you go into turn one, if something fails, the failure is going to be spectacular because you're going and there's a curve coming up. You've got to go. Dave Silverthorne, for some reason, and I don't remember how it happened. Oh, wow. I ended up this. putting his car on its roof, probably three quarters of the way down the front stretch and then right up the bank and right up and into the wall at the top of turn one. And sparks were flying, his car was turning, and it was, I don't believe fire happened, but it was an awful lot of sparks. Again, testament to the safety that always saved a lot of people out there. They really required safe seats, uh, fire suits, the helmets, the straps, everything like that. So no matter what happens to the outside, the cocoon that the driver's in is still pretty safe. So he got out of his car, which was upside down on the track, and had unbuckled himself, and he got out. And Dave Silverthorne, they called him Stretch. He was a big, big, tall man. He was a big guy, crammed into this race car. And, and I talked before about the adrenaline that these guys are feeling. As they're racing, there's a ton of adrenaline going on. Well, you don't land on your roof on purpose. There was something happened that, that somehow somebody caught him and flipped his car. And he got out of there, and he was madder than a fiddler. He And... So I'm the guy on the scene, and I'm there because I'm on the front stretch. I beat the emergency truck there. And here's Dave crawling out of his car, and I got the microphone in his face. <laughs> wow, Dave, it's good to see you. All right. Yeah, well, and he, anyway, that was one of those times when I probably shouldn't have, right in that moment, stuck a microphone in his face. But uh, again, it's as much, for me, it was as much relief to see after all the sparks and the car doing what it was and the, the, the smashed up, wadded up thing that was sitting in the corner, to see this man get out of it and that he's okay. All right, go ahead. Let, let some steam off, Dave. I'm glad you're okay. Uh, all's well that ends well in that particular case, but it was one of the more spectacular ones that I witnessed. One of the things that, that, um, that I remember, not so much a thing as much as a person who contributed and a lot of us have had this in mind because of his success at the NASCAR Sprint Cup level as Martin Truex Jr.'s crew chief, Cole Perrin. Sure. I remember there was always debate in terms of how to say his last name. <laughs> <laughs> I was always taught it was Perrin, not Pern. Right. And so I always get a little bit of the when, uh uh when, which is anxiousness. <laughs> Although that sounded more like quagmire. No, not even quagmire. Who does that? Quagmire's giggity, 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 giggity. <laughs> when Cole gets mentioned on a NASCAR broadcast, I go halfway between Kramer and Quagmire. That's yeah. my own issue. Um, and to hear Daryl Waltrip going, Cole Pern. I was talking to Cole Pern this morning. Well, Cole almost won the, the NASCAR Sprint Cup Championship this year as a crew chief. He did. He used to race with us. Yes. At, uh, at Delaware Speedway. Yep. Do you remember Cole, or what do you remember of him? I, I, I remember Cole vividly. I remember him. Uh, you know, his, his dad uh, was involved in racing way back. Uh, his mom was a faithful fan, he was seeing his race shop going by, the, uh, driving down the road. He was always there. Kubota, I think. I, I remember buying a, um, a, a trackside chair, a folding-out trackside chair. For right, the, the folding people. chair. Yeah. Yep. Uh, when he was there, he went off to school. And he, I believe he went to Laurier or, in, or Waterloo. He went, he went to the KW anyway. Went off to school to study engineering. And I never really knew beyond that. Well, he's done that and away he went. Well, away he went down to the States to be a pit, uh, pit engineer or a crew engineer or what do you call them? What was his title there? That's he, as good as I could do. He never got any camera time that I saw when, I, when he first started with the, with the Furniture Row Racing Team. But once or twice, I heard his name. Well, the engineer for that car is it? Uh, and then he became crew chief of Martin Truix's team. And suddenly it's like, yes, go Cole, yes. And then when they finally, you know, had some shots of him. And I think that Daryl Waltrip must really like him or must sense the genuine nature of Cole Perrin because he would often refer to him in the last couple of seasons. I was talking to Cole Perrin, Cole Pern, and Cole Pern, <laughs> but he spoke very favorably of him like he was an, you know, a Canadian guy that Cole Pern. And like the U.S. version of Don Cherry, but. Uh, 
Yeah, I have a lot of uh, fond memories of watching him race. And uh, he was always a really, again, to my, because I'm the guy sticking the microphone in your face, win, lose, or draw. He was always very even-tempered, always fairly quiet, fairly well-spoken, didn't, not too excitable. That's my memory of him. Good race car driver, too. Absolutely. And a smart, smart guy, clearly. Yeah. yeah. Good family. Yeah. Anyway, Cole, uh, we're really, really proud of you. And uh, that's an example of we're, we're centering out Cole a little bit here. But we could be here for hours talking about uh, the people, the characters, the stories. We'll have to maybe come back to, to some of those. We should write a book. <laughs> well, we, uh, I, I, won't, I was going to say something else, but I'll save that for, uh, for another time. Um, before we wrap up, I know there are other things that happen because when you have a commitment to be somewhere, it's funny the lengths that you will go to. At, at certain times. And I have a vague recollection of you uh, taking an annual bike trip. Derek's a, a motorcycle enthusiast, by the way. And uh, you would often go gallivanting across North America. Uh, as your sidekick uh, at the racetrack, I always had a much higher level of comfort if you were there, <laughs> oh. as opposed to if you were not. <laughs> Um, and I wonder if maybe the, an expression, a, 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 an innocent and honest expression of that on a Friday morning when I maybe had asked you via email, because I don't think I was texting yet at that point, um, where you were, <laughs> where in the world is Derek Botten? Was it Indianapolis? I know that you had been in Arkansas on that trip. Well, Colorado but, that year, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And um, why don't you take it from there? Well... I, I remember taking, a, planning my bike trip and going, I think I said to you and or Brad, gee, guys, I, I don't think I'm going to make it back for Friday. Don't count on me. Plan on me not being there and because uh, I just don't know. You never know. There's all the, anything could happen on a motorcycle trip to delay him. We were planning. I was going out with some friends of mine who were going out to do a race in, uh, uh, in Colorado. And so I thought, well, all right, but I, I don't think I'm going to be back. Anyway, I, it turned out the way things happened, I came back and I, that Friday morning, I woke up in Indianapolis. It's not like I just woke up wondering, but I had you know, part of the trip home taken me as far as Indianapolis and I woke up and I don't think that's a long drive to make it there. And especially because we were asked to be there to start. Seems to me it was like 4.30 in the afternoon. I remember being at Delaware Speedway on a regular basis and I thought, no way, no way I'm going to be back. So... Anyway, I think we communicated. Yeah, don't, don't bother planning on it. But I had, for one thing after another, it ended up being a smooth, flawless, and fairly quick uh, <laughs> ride home. And I didn't get home. I drove straight. I came off, the, uh, came off the highway through Sarnia, 402, and stopped at Delaware Speedway. My bags were still packed on my bike. I was still wearing my leather riding pants. Hey, Kev. <laughs> Need an announcer? <laughs> And I, I ended up staying that night and doing the announcing. I think you had got somebody else there to fill in. And it might have been Jamie Modsley or somebody was all set to do my, my reporting do, uh, duty. But Really? Yeah. Well, if that had happened, they probably joined me in the tower then for the night. Might well have happened. I, uh, I'll have to ask Jamie that. If, uh, if the, uh, what I remember about that was that it was one of those Hollywood moments. <laughs> It was well, like, yeah, these, these angelic voices went off. <laughs> and then, you know, you, jang you didn't have spurs on, but you may no. as well. And, you know, the, like the Old West, there's Derek. <laughs> His leather riding pants. But uh, um, that was a good one. But there's, you know what, there's, there's so many, uh, so many things that happen in the course of a night. I'd have to sit and do some math to even recollect how many, how many events we even did together in that. You're right. It would be some math. I don't know. It seems to me that for the entire time that I was announcing, so were you. Because I think you were ended up managing the place right around the time when I left, it seems to me. But, uh, well, and so that's where I was going to go. That's a lot of years that and that's if, a lot of races. If it was 99 that we started, it was somewhere in the mid-2000s that uh, I knew that even before uh, that change had been made with what I was doing during the day, I know I pretty much had the sense that I had kind of come to the end of my run with it was a big commitment to go out there every single friday because what were you doing at the time during the do you remember, remember morning radio that for who for the hawk i was on the hawk at 103.9 and the, what i didn't have to do was work saturday mornings so i had i would go home on a friday try and catch a bit of a nap 
And the worst part was in the, in the brilliant sunshine of a summer afternoon when it's nice and warm. The last thing I wanted to do was put a hot racing suit on and go out to the racetrack. But I did. And as soon as I got there, I went, yes, this is what I want to do. And it was just as soon as I walked through the gates, I could hear cars firing. I could smell it just, yep, I'm in the right place. So that was, I had, I'm, I worked that morning, had a little nap, got up and came down ready to do the racing thing. But I didn't have to get up on the Saturday mornings. One of the things that caused me to leave is when I changed radio stations and part of my deal was to work the Saturday morning show. That was a tough thing to do is to work the, the Friday night show because we wouldn't be out of there until 11 at the earliest. And then we're pumped and, and then to go home and have to get up again at 4.30 for a morning show wouldn't... I, I didn't last long doing that. So you were, yeah, getting up at 4.30. You're on the air at 6. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and then, because we would often be out at the racetrack at, at, at Delaware till what, 11 o'clock anyway? Yep. I guess we would have that as a yep. bit of an unofficial curfew. Uh, that's a long day. Yeah. And um, didn't you have a like a pedometer or something that you put on yourself at one point? No, I think you were trying to convince me how many miles I'd worked in a night where you were gauging the tread left on my running shoes or something. Well, maybe, I remember you used to joke about that. Well, I just wondered how far you would travel in the course of an event. If I remember right, you used to actually put ankle weights on you a couple of weeks before the season would start. I did. I had to because I'm going up and down the stairs, up and down the track, cross the track, just everywhere. And... When you're sitting, you know, in the, all winter long and not doing anything, and then suddenly it's, oh, race season's coming up. I got to, and of course, as the years go on, you get older and you just need that more. And I, I have some five pound ankle weights that I would walk around with during the day just to reaccustom my legs. It was a smart move, I think, on my part of one of the few smart moves I've done. But <laughs> yeah. Where, um, where does that whole experience fit in your mind in the, uh, journey of Derek Botten so far? You know, they, they say that when you're, uh, when you're doing something you're enjoying, it's not a job. It never felt like a job. I guess it was. I guess it was a part-time job because we got paid for doing it. We had certain times to be there and, to, and certain expectations and a time to leave. Never felt like a job. It always felt like a privilege to be out there. All right. All right. Look what I get to do. You know? Being around cars, around people, around you, with a microphone in my hand, every day is a good day. We've got so many things I'd love to ask you about because we haven't touched on radio, motorcycle shows, squash, <laughs> <laughs> that I should put with big air quotes, uh, and, and a lot of big conversations after that, But uh, and I'm sure that there are other things that this conversation, you're probably going to be halfway home and think, ah, I wish I'd have brought that up. So uh, maybe we can do this again, I don't know, five or six times down the road. Happy to. But uh, uh, for now, uh, that was a lot of fun. Thanks, yeah. buddy. Love you so much and so glad that, uh, that that racetrack brought us together. Thanks for doing this. <laughs> Been a pleasure. You'll soon be able to find Derek online at DerekBotten.com. That's B-O-T-T-E-N, DerekBotten.com. You might already be able to, depending on when you're listening to this. I want to thank Derek for taking the time to uh, come here and have this conversation. And thank you to you for listening. Feel welcome to join me online at kevinbolmer.com. My last name is B-U-L-M-E-R, kevinbolmer.com. Or you can also use noscheduleman.com. That's a little easier to remember. You'll be able to find all the podcasts there as well as all the other blog postings and links to my other social media accounts. And I'd love to have you join me at facebook.com slash noscheduleman or look for our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash noscheduleman. You can also find us on Twitter, Instagram, and a few others. Wherever you might be looking, just remember Kevin Bolmer or No Schedule Man, and you'll find us there. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next time on the No Schedule Man podcast. <laughs>